All right, and we're back for match number three. Uh, looks like Brian's on the play, leading with a wasteland, and he has a vial in his opening hand, which is definitely a good start for him. On the, on the other hand, uh, Michael's hand is not a Mox Diamond hand, but does have Grove Punishing Fire, which can prove to do a lot of work. Right, um, yeah, Grove Punishing Fire is probably one of the better engines in this matchup. Uh, a little bit slow, like you said, being on the draw without a Mox Diamond, uh, and a little susceptible to that Wasteland, but uh, if you can get that going, it's going to be pretty difficult for the human stack to beat. Also notable about Michael's hand is the lack of black mana. So he has this Liliana that's two black mana away from being cast, and there's not even one in the hand, but I, I, I suppose over time, uh, Life from the Loam might, might be able to get going, and just finding a single fetch land would allow him to alleviate himself of the black mana problems while also digging for a second Punishing fire to deal a lot of damage. And it really shows how much of a priority he's putting on this punishing fire engine if he's willing to keep this hand without any black mana. Uh, he, he, he must think that that engine is powerful enough on its own. Uh, Brian leading on the wasteland instead of the uh, even having uh, three champion of the parishes in his hand. That uh, signals to me that he would be willing to wasteland uh, Bondi's first land over playing two champions if he was to draw another white source, which is an interesting approach. Yeah, I, I, I think he's valuing valuing the mana denial in the non mox diamond hands that uh, that that Michael would keep. So, for instance, we could see Michael just keeping a good Grove of the Baron Willis plant hand as he has here. And it would be beneficial to be able to wasteland and play a champion of the parish, even if he draws another land that would enable two champion parishes on turn two. Right, but uh, we we see we see Michael peeling that mox diamond right off the top like a like a four color professional. It really really accelerated his hand, made it way better than it was before. Uh, it took it from being just good to to great now with a turn one dark confidant. Yeah, so both of the players have their ideal artifacts in play that allow them to abuse ma mana over time. So. We have Michael being able to have two mana on the first turn, and Brian's going to be able to utilize this vial, to, which will probably stay on two for a while, just being able to keep on jamming two drops and eventually go up to this recruiter and uh, produce tons of mana over the course of the game. If uh, if Brian can manage to get these champions pretty big, uh, Michael's hand is actually a little a little weak to that since since he's relying so heavily on this uh, punishing fire. Uh, if you can get these champions up into three threes and then start attacking them into the Dark Confidant and uh, chipping away at Michael's life total and turning it into a liability, uh, it's definitely a, a very easy avenue to victory. Yeah, so so Michael has two options here in the second second main phase after this attack. But but this attack's actually pretty interesting too. What do you do in Brian's situation? Well, Michael attacking means that he's given the option to Bryant, uh, and he's willing for that trade to happen. So it, what that says to me from Brian's perspective is that uh, Michael cares more about getting this champion of the parish off the table than he cares about the card advantage that's going to play out throughout the, throughout the rest of this game. Um, and if that's the case, I think from Brian's perspective, he does not want to make that trade, and, and it seems like he sniffed that out. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting, like, he thinks that I think, like, the... Princess Diary sort of thing, mm -hmm. because if if uh, if Michael's presenting this attack, then it must be bad for me to block. But then he knows that, so then he attacks every time, and now I'm just taking two free damage. So it kind of goes back and forward. But um, we we knew that regardless, this punishing fire would probably be used. And and leading on the wasteland is actually really smart on Michael's part because if Bryant has another wasteland in his hand, he wa he wants to protect this grove. So effectively, this grove minimally becomes another shock on a creature. Uh, so, so definitely a good play to not expose the Grove on the turn that he knows that he's going to be playing Punishing Fire. And and this is now actually this... The, the, the sequence that you outlined. So getting at least one of the champion of the Parish up to 3-3 three, three is a pretty big game for Brian. And he identified that by uh, being able to just uh, take up the Violet to 2 and activate it on this main phase. Yeah, and that's... Uh... And it's possible that that's the reason that Brian didn't block, because if he had blocked, then the, the champion that's currently casting for three uh, would have instead be dying to that Punishing Fire. So uh, Brian recognizing that getting that to the 3-3 the three, three range is really relevant, and now it's going to be very difficult for uh, Bonnie to take off the table. Yeah, so it's the way the game developed is definitely pretty interesting, though. Uh, 
high, high level play from both players. What to do with Aether Vial this turn is pretty interesting. Taking up to three per, locks you out of every two drop that you would draw, but it unlocks this Imperial Recruiter. So the Imperial Recruiter facilitates the Champion of the Fair to be able to grow every turn. And taking up to three, as Brian did here, makes it such that when you draw land, you still enable all your other two drops. Because the two drops are kind of the bigger payoffs in this deck, not the three drops like that we're used to in Modern with Mantis Rider Reflector Mage. So, uh, and yeah, being able to draw the land and drop the Stylish Lieutenant. Now now, he, now Brian has two creatures that are larger than that Punishing Fire threshold that you described earlier. So this, this big Tomic is protecting his land. So now all the two drops are live. He has three drops through the vial, so definitely a very commanding position for Bryant. Yeah, totally. And if you take a look at the at Michael's deck list, uh, something that sometimes comes up in these four color loam decks is they end up playing something like a Toxic Deluge or uh, some sort of mass removal spell, uh, perhaps a Plague Engineer. But you don't see any of those in the in the main deck. So, uh, and and Bryant, I'm sure keenly aware of that, knowing that he can go uh, wide with the Stalys Lieutenant, and it's going to be very difficult for for Bondi to take everything off the table since uh, uh, d doesn't have any one-mana spells since they are a Chalice of the Void deck. So uh, getting to the point where they can cast more than one spell a turn is, is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. The the Breath Decay is definitely a good draw to be able to kill the big champion, but now Tomic's like the other the other problem. But yeah, between Maze of Ith, Abrupt Decay, like... It looks like the way this game's playing out, uh, it, it can get away from Brian, even though he's able to generate a really good like board. So it'll be interesting totally. to see how the next few turns like pay out, uh, play out. Yeah, I was saying that uh, it's difficult for the four color loam deck to to double spell early, but uh, Maze of Ith kind of functions like a one mana spell uh, mm -hmm. that you use every turn at the cost of a land drop. And uh, it, you, you're definitely seeing the effect of that here, where he's able to neutralize this champion of the parish, deal with it at a later date, and uh, start chipping away at these smaller creatures. Yeah, and so Lone's going to be able to do a lot of work in terms of uh, acting like a pseudo and special recall in terms of not only the cards that it acquires, but in terms of digging for more punishing fires. So the the creatures outside of this champion of the parish are, are all going to be susceptible to punishing fire so unless a brian's able to produce another creature that has enough toughness it's actually going to be pretty difficult from brian in the spot so it's pretty interesting how the the game kind of turned on dime there we we felt like michael kind of you know ha had an advantage for a while with the start confidant and punishing fire but then brian was able to make a big creature and now michael has a maze of it so it's a great back and forward in this matchup Unfortunately, it feels like a lot of this is going to be kind of like cleanup. Uh, one one terrific draw that Brian can have is uh, another wasteland. So being able to wasteland a Maze of Ith pre combat and then get in a huge hit with a champion is important. And Michael's kind of racing to try to find the second black mana for the Liliana because then, b besides looking for other punishing fires, which can kind of clean up some of the extra stuff. Liliana and Abrupt Decay are going to be his main ways to be able to interact with the Champion of the Parish, but uh, Loam can help facilitate finding the Black Mana, whereas dredging Loam every turn wouldn't help with finding Abrupt Decay. But uh, with the Life right. from the Loam it's in a, the it's hand... A, it's a really slow engine. Yeah, and, and with the Life from the Loam in the hand, he has this option of playing Sylvan Library, so I'm, interesting to see, uh, I'm interested in seeing what he does this turn. We, we saw uh, Michael Wasteland Bryant uh, the previous turn. Uh... And interesting to me because it felt like to me that uh, Brian should have been prioritizing uh, getting to a, a higher mana density, but uh, mm -hmm. he felt far enough ahead at that stage where he thought it was okay to uh, keep Brian restricted on just his threes uh, with the Aether Vial and uh, force him to draw more specific cards instead of a wider variety of cards since uh, he's applying so much pressure. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That Thalys Lieutenant is actually a, a pretty good draw since this uh, Tomic is, like you said earlier, uh, one of the, the few threats that the human dex has that doesn't die to Punishing Fire. And just getting that slightly larger and uh, shaving shaving a full two turns off the clock, actually, um, is going to be pretty relevant here. Uh, really 
able to to find more specific answers at a at a faster pace. Yeah, and Brian being able to apply this type of pressure and causing uh, Michael to need to rebuy Punishing Fire every turn makes it such that he's not able to use Life from the Loam. But big draw, draw stuff there and abrupt decay. So now that that was one of the answers that can just kill this champion of the pairs outright and then now maze of it goes to the next largest creature which is this tomek and yeah he probably ends up taking out the tomek instead just so that he has access to his ren sixes and his wastelands if he wants to um but the 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 risk for this is that if uh bryant ends up finding a wasteland then uh the champion of the pairs is just lethal in one hit as opposed to two yep yeah for those of you at home you know just bear with us the life totals are backwards so it's actually michael that's at six and brian that's at 21 which makes sense through the punishing fires so so yeah that that was definitely a really big decision point between abrupt decaying the champion of the parish and abrupt decaying the tomic so big draw step for brian here wasteland yeah. for lethal Wasteland would be lethal, and and uh, one of the reasons I think that Michael wanted to get rid of the Tomic was he was able to wasteland uh, Brian's Horizon Canopy, mm -hmm. and like like we've been discussing the even these random one ones they don't seem like they're super relevant, but what they're doing is they're forcing Michael to uh, rebuy and cast Punishing Fire every turn, which is tying up his mana pretty significantly. And uh, if if Brian ends up taking even a single turn off of doing that, it could uh, give Michael the the reprieve he needs in order to tur turn the game around uh, indefinitely. Yeah, and it's kind of like a nice dance that we play in the Legacy format between uh, like like Wasteland cutting off mana, but this Wasteland also produces a mana for me because right now Michael's trying to utilize a lot of his mana over time, but being able to deny, for instance, this turn, Bryant would have been able to have the optionality of playing uh, Thalia or Mother of Runes, but here the decision is made for him, and then, um, you know, the like... It's interesting how the players are kind of like allowing the other players to do things through their actions. So, so a little so bit of a risk here from Michael, but I, I, I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he opted to punish you fire the Mother of Runes instead of the Thalia's Lieutenant. And what this means is if uh, if Brian draws a three drop on this turn, this Thalia's Lieutenant is going to permanently get out of rank of this punishing fire. But I think Michael felt far enough behind that he had to take this risk, mm -hmm. hope that uh, Brian misses for one turn. And if if Brian does end up doing that, then I think that this game will be pretty close to locked up, uh, barring another three toughness creature naturally. Yeah, definitely a big difference between some of the good players to some of the great players. So if you want to level up your game, a lot of it is identifying where you need to just narrow down what can actually happen in this game. So forcing Brian to have it this turn, because if he doesn't have it this turn, my expectancy of winning for the next turn, uh, for for the coming turns, is a lot higher. So, I I really like the play there for Michael. Is this punishing fire is gonna the clean up the last of the thousand ten? You can you can assume that Brian doesn't have a three drop there, or else it would have already been in play, got, gotten that extra point of damage, and uh, this Liliana taking care of the champion means that, barring a a sequence where uh, Brian is able to put punching fire in a play and a wasteland for for this maze of it it's going to be very difficult for him to win the game mm -hmm. and all of that is going to be even more difficult because uh have any more lands uh in in the in the following turns since uh the, the loam wasteland will be able to take bryant off of that and and even restrict it to only three drops yeah and and I don't think there's any three drops that uh, Bryant would be able to draw and then kind of flash in on the end step like a like a Geist of Saint Trap sort of thing that would get past the maze. So yeah, what, one a thing a little bit grim. One one thing you could see uh, in some humans' list is Mantis Rider. I know some of the the humans regulars have been toying around with with that the inclusion of that card or the exclusion. But mm -hmm. uh, more recently, the builds have been playing uh, the Recruiter package, which I think is taking up similar deck space. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because it has a, a better variety, um, it's less it's less linear. Uh, part of the benefit of this deck is that it can it can kind of play a less linear game. Uh, but that means that in this specific uh, place, I don't actually believe that there are many uh, three toughness creatures left in in Brian's deck. Yeah. And and Michael's still ident is still identifying that like this vial just locks out. Um, well, it, being on three and not being able to violin the one and two drops 
makes it such that his wastelands are still pretty potent. So right now for this turn, if Bryant were to draw a two drop, it's just going to get discarded to Liliana. So kind of starting to put him in the squeeze and then next turn he's able to dredge life from the loam, play another wasteland and now it's only three drops and Michael really doesn't have to worry about many things that are left in Brian's deck. Second so. Punishing Fire was found there. Uh... Cool. Yeah, it's th that makes the game wrap up a little bit faster, so it's it's not looking you know too good for Brian. It was good to see a game where they both had their uh, their artifacts that allowed them to do a lot with the mana. Yeah, and if, and if we go back to that first turn, the, this game w was night and day with that Mox Diamond off the top, right? Mm -hmm. uh, w without that, the, the Dark Confident wouldn't come into play, wouldn't have given uh, Michael the Velocity that he needed uh, to punch and fire plus buyback on two. It would have been much slower. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would have been it would have been totally different, but uh, it looks like uh, Bryant has succumbed, and we're gonna head over to sideboarding now. Who, yeah. who do you think this improves for more after board? Do you think the uh, the humans deck gets better, or the four color deck gets better? Hmm. So typically, game one would favor the four color loam, and since they're aware that they're good against other creature decks, I would see them sideboarding less cards for this type of matchup because they already have so many tools in the main deck. So. The, the Chalice Dance is pretty weird between Aether Vial and uh, Cavern of Souls on Bryant's side. So the Four Color Loam deck could, on the draw, want to board out the Chalices and then have more removal spells. So the Sorts of Plowshares are good. Plague Engineer, I could think of a creature type that a lot of things appear to share. Uh, the Goyf could be good. Trophy. Um, and then... Uh, so... Yeah, so... Just, just seeing how he wants to play the game on the draw. I, I can actually see sideboarding change a lot between play and the draw for that reason. Uh, mostly Chalice's value. How about for the human side for you? Yeah, I'm looking at the the human sideboard, and and there, there you can see that it's very tailored towards some of the the combo decks that are, that currently exist in the format. There's there's Sanctum Prelates, there's Grafters Cages, Surgicals. All these are tools that are are not super effective in this matchup. Surgical is something that uh, Brian could possibly consider if he's worried a lot about the Punishing Fire engine, but usually these aggressive Wasteland decks uh, don't really necessarily need that. You can just uh, naturally play through it. Um, but it looks like he's actually looking at this uh, Fairy Macabre mm. one card and use his recruiters to have effectively four answers to Punishing Fire. So I, I think that I like that a lot better than the Surgical for sure. But yeah. um, overall, it, it, it's not looking like Bryant is improving that much after board. He gets a little bit more uh, redundancy with his recruiters, and just recruiter itself as an extra body uh, could be useful against the four-color loam deck. But I would be really worried as Bryant uh, about these two plug engineers that are coming in from the other side. Yeah, like they're both not sideboarding that much because a lot of them have elements of being able to attack the opponent and... Uh, the they, they're kind of always doing their plan A, but uh, w w with the fine-tuning, and especially Plague Engineer, like you pointed out, it makes a lot of sense that sideboarding would be better for Michael than it is for Bryant. But the, the Fairy Macabre is very interesting. It could lead to a lot of interesting situations, such as, hey, surprise, I gave your Knight of the Reliquary my two mice two, or like snagging the Singleton Loam or uh, Ren and Six really needing to buy back, say, a Maze of it that was Wastelanded and then be able to Fairy Macabre. There's a lot of different things that can happen there. Yeah, a lot of utility that you get out of the one spot, especially when you, you combine it with instant speed uh, vial activations to tutor it up. Uh, the the humans deck gets that that is really good is uh, the additional copy of Palace Scaler, which I think might be one of their best uh, cards in this matchup. Mm -hmm. And with the, the extra Palace Scaler and the extra Imperial Recruiter virtually doubling the number of Palace Scalers that he has uh, compared to game one, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, could, we could see a, a greater focus on trying to play uh, that sort of game in the post-board games. Yeah. So we're going to head back down to the match to see how these cyborg decisions affect what happens, but also Brian being on the play can be huge depending on his opening hand. Yeah, we see Brian keeping a, a slightly slower hand. Uh, he has no turn one plays, no Vial, no Noble Hierarch, uh, but two copies of Horizon Canopy, which will mean that uh, he's going to have more gas going into late game, and, and just the curve of Tomic into 
an answer to Plague Engineer, an answer to Dark Confidant, or or an aggressive clock if uh, Michael doesn't present anything to to deal with with the Thali's lieutenant. Yeah, Horizon Lands make mulliganing very interesting, but also having the Cavern of Souls, should Michael have kept, for instance, a Mox Diamond Chalice of the Void Hand, now Brian sort of shuts that down for a while. So uh, getting a lot of utility from the lands, uh, Krakus being able to save Tomek, uh, and, and Thalia, like future potential Thalias, makes, uh, makes Krakus very good. So all four of these lands do something besides produce mana. So... It makes it makes sense why Brian would keep this hand. Totally, we we see a double mox diamond star from from Michael though, which Jeez. will will let him steal the initiative back for sure. Um, uh, yeah. pretty keenly aware that uh, the humans deck, due to partially due to its mana base and due to the nature of the deck, doesn't have uh, any removal spells that aren't creature based. Um, mm -hmm. so outside of these deputy detentions, uh, there's there's no real effective way to take this Knight of the Relicary off the table, and uh, I think anyone who's played with or against that card knows how devastating it can be if you on top with it. Yeah, it was actually a really interesting decision for Michael, because uh, the Taiga was kind of free, but in terms of the second land, that would be discarded to the second Mox Diamond. You have two utility lands, so Caracas can help, j just like how Brian's Caracas can save Tomek and save uh, Thalia, uh, Michael's Caracas can effectively just bounce it every turn. So there's a lot of utility in the Caracas, and the Grove of the Burn Wills is really good for a potential punishing fire. However, keeping the Grove and the Caracas can prevent uh, Michael from having access to any land in his deck by using Knight of the Rel Reliquary, sacking whatever he would heath for, likely a forest or plains. Uh, so really tough decision, but ultimately keeping the two spell lands, drawing Wasteland to uh, attack Cook's mana base. So... Just really going for the throat here. Yeah, just smacking for five on turn two, really taking the aggressive route, which is not something that we we really expected, but uh, it was just the nature of his hand, I suppose. And uh, the Caracas is actually going to be somewhat devastating. Uh, taking a look at Brian's hand, as you said, he has one of his uh, seven legendary two drops, and it's going to be uh, basically just putting a counter on his uh, Thalos hand and not doing much else this turn. Yeah, so what do you think needs to go right for Bryant this game? Because it, it's pretty apparent to everyone that, you know, turn one of the Knight of the Reliquary is going to be very difficult for a deck with not many removable spells to interact with. So how can you see the game, like, playing out from here? So uh, fortunately for Bryant, like we said earlier, uh, Michael had to get rid of all of his force slash planes uh, for these box diamonds. So he's not activating this knight for value. He's just getting in some damage. So if uh, Brian is capable of getting this uh, knight off the table, there won't be any uh, long lasting effects besides the damage that he took. And uh, so if he, he can find a way to, to do that, then it will be almost as if he recouped all of that, all of that tempo back. Yeah, so deputy uh, detention is a way to do that, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, Michael has that abrupt decay, so he's going to have to find another answer, another palace jailer or deputy. Right. So pa palace jailer seems like it could be the best answer, and Cook might even be searching for one next turn through this uh, imperial recruiter, or maybe he'll play the the deputy of detention, knowing that it's really just decay that would punish him there because he doesn't see Punishing Fire Grow the Burn Wells, so there's not many other removal spells that would be able to kill the deputy. So it'll be interesting to yeah, see I... what Bryant would do on this turn, but Michael not attacking means that he has to be getting Wasteland, identifying that Palace Jailer is long-term the way that Bryant gets back in this game. Palace Jailer has this uh, almost unique text that's not, not immediately apparent to everyone, that uh, you, you don't you don't get the creature back until you become the monarch, not until you you get rid of the creature like like you would with a a banishing priest or a, other O ring type effects, and uh, with Michael only having the one creature in play, that that is a way that it's going to be very difficult for him to ever uh, get that footing back, uh, since uh, Bryant will have the monarch start drawing two cards a turn. It's going to be very difficult for Michael to ever take it back. Yeah, I like the in person convention of putting the creature under the monarch instead of under like the palace jailer just leaving exile. That way it shows that that's where like the O ring effect belongs. Uh, so Brian definitely needs to draw a couple lands here and and fade uh, a couple force or planes off the top so he doesn't get wasted anymore. The second Caracas, though, is some, some comical, <laughs> comical justice. Yeah. Rock is a very powerful land and legacy. It deals with Mirror Lake, deals with Emrakul, protects your own legendary creatures, but 
drawing two of them is not uh, not what Brian was looking for here. Yeah, uh, deploying the Sanctum Prelate is pretty good though. Uh, being a Mox Diamond deck, uh, like the four color Loam deck, uh, is heavily redundant on two drops. So Punching Fire, Abrupt Decay, uh, previously Life from the Loam, but now Rend and Six. So all these things are actually blanked by the Sanctum Prelate. So an aggressive attack from uh, from Brian. Yeah, uh, honestly, surprised not to see the abrupt decay there in response uh, from Michael. Perhaps has uh, future plans, but but like you said, they are so glutted on two, and I think he uh, probably could have expected uh, Brian to to suss that out and name two at his Sanctum Prelate. Mm -hmm. Is that this uh, this Sanctum Prelate is going to be relegated to Kelp Lock and Duty uh, fairly soon? In which case, uh, keeping the abrupt decay around might have some future value. So, so I actually take that back. I think the attack with the Lieutenant was really good. I, I was considering chop, chump blocking that turn, but attack with the Lieutenant makes a lot of sense because this turn you can just block with the, the Knight, but, or you can block the Knight with the Lieutenant, but if you hit a land, you would have been able to block with uh, your Imperial Recruiter if you wanted to tutor Palace Jailer, or you would have played Deputy of Detention already. So that was actually a really good attack from Bryant that I didn't identify at first. A heads up play there. Liliana, definitely a back-breaking draw. One of the few non-two drops in the deck that can uh, definitely shift this game. He's going to have to uh, sack the Sanctum Prelate here, or else he's going to be in what we call the Abyss. Uh, but even even this trade, if that's something that Michael wants, is not going to be uh, that effective for Brian, since this Liliana is going to start stripping his hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but Michael valuing the the Knight of the Reliquary more than the Thales Lieutenant. Yeah. So so Michael's not able to activate Knight of the Reliquary because he still has all these utility lands in play that are not forced and planes. So drawing a land was very good for Bryant there. It allows this Thales Lieutenant to outsize the the knight. The big question is, are we killing Liliana or not? We know that if he goes after Liliana, Abrupt Decay is going to be game because it would clear the last blocker. Also, uh, like the the Liliana uptick, like not a lot of the cards actually matter right now in Brian's hand, especially for instance this this Tomek. So Ooh. yeah, so Brian Brian trying to cast a uh, deputy here, but I think he I realize. As as a regular storm player, did not realize that uh, deputy is actually a Vidalkin, not a human. Yeah, he had to name uh, humanoid that way. It kind of covers both of them, right? But yeah. <laughs> so unfortunate there. It, it does mean have other options uh, it, on this turn, but it yeah, does. It, 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 it could lead to a better, been a better long play game plan, though. Um, in terms of playing the recruiter, if he draws yet another land, palace jailer will still break this game open. Right. The having to sack the Sanctum Prelate does mean that uh the, the twos were unlocked out of Michael Bondi's hand. So mm -hmm. it looks like uh Bryant is prioritizing getting rid of those again uh over playing recruiter kind of requires him to draw land on the next turn and also requires Michael to not draw land, uh mm -hmm. forest or planes or in order for him to get wastelanded. So I think I like this play a little bit better. Um and it, it's possible that he's actually uh, trying to win the game, um, hoping that Michael doesn't have another removal spell here, since since his jump block is forced, uh, thus unlocking the twos again. But he did put Michael on a two turn clock, so perhaps was just hoping that the two wasn't in the hand. Yeah, definitely picking a spot there. I, I can't say I disagree with it. It it seems like really narrowing down the amount of draw steps Michael has, but and and Brian probably has a pretty good read of the types of cards that are in Michael's hand right now. And th this, this abrupt decay is going to be very difficult for him. Right. Had he held back, he would have been able to, to check this Knight of the Reliquary, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's a winning proposition anyways, because mm -hmm. uh, Michael's still drawing arguably more powerful cards. Um, if they continue to stare at each other, this Liliana is going to threaten an edict across two, two turn cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be pretty difficult for him to win, win that type of game as well, barring uh, a draw of a blue source would probably be his best draw for to, to put the Vidalkin into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I could see it being like, okay, it's really weird that Brian attacked. Uh, like, 
obviously he has to block the Santa and prelay and now all these twos are unlocked uh, but it, it it also gave Bryant a, like a realistic situation where Michael doesn't have like much action in hand and blanks on one more draw step and now Bryant is just putting uh putting Michael in the abyss instead so it seems like a weird play but I I'm pretty behind it like he he really identified how he can win this game yeah, he was he was playing to win and and not playing not to lose is is the the classic mantra. Uh, one thing I might have liked to see uh, slightly different if that was his game plan would be to play the recruiter instead of the sanctum prelate on the previous turn and to the palace killer gives you the opportunity to draw that fourth land and play and play it uh, since that creature was just going to count block anyways. You weren't really locking out any any relevant CMC spells. Yeah, and and like that we see Michael take the match. On my end, I don't know if you disagree, uh, but just a classic control versus aggro trope. Uh, mm -hmm. The control deck f filled with uh, removal spells. Uh, all they required was a little bit of time, enough time to to get its stable footing and uh, take over the game. It had enough inevitability. Yeah, the the games were definitely pretty interesting. So j just to go over what happened again. So in game one, we had Aether Vial versus Mox Diamond, and uh, the vial ending up uh, taking t blah, blah. the vial taking up to three and then being able to be wastelanded off the remaining lands. But really, the maze of Ith, I think, was the star of game one, like being able yeah. to attack that champion of the parish when not much else would. It really, really let uh, Michael turn the corner by effectively dealing with two threats on one turn cycle and really uh, taking over the game that way. Yeah, and then the punching fire being able to deal with all the other small creatures while just this champion is being checked the whole time. And then the 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 second game was definitely difficult for Bryant from the start. I I really like the lines he took though, especially that last attack where it looked like very counterintuitive to attack with a giant Thalia's lieutenant that is actually bigger than either reliquary and have the sanctum prelate. Bryant was making it so that way he could win the game and not lose and uh i i could see myself re-watching that match to kind of identify like what like 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 what was going through brian's head i i think it's really cool <laughs> yeah not surprised to see that from him he's a, a a seasoned storm pilot probably probably very good at uh deciding when he has to pick his spots and when he has to to take calculated risks uh but yeah, that's it for that match. Let's take a look at the standings and uh, see where we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. so With this win... See... Oh, oh, go ahead. Know. Yeah, <laughs> It's fine. You got it. Uh, Michael Bondé uh, cemented himself into the, the winner's bracket of the uh, elimination stage after after the uh, after the groups, and uh, Brian moved down to towards loser finals. He's not out of it yet. He's still going to win uh, one more match in order to get himself into that good bracket, get himself that bye. Mm -hmm. And then in the loser's bracket, the next match we should be seeing is Pleasant Kenobi against Caleb Durward. So uh, a battle of two brews uh, will definitely be interesting, uh, very different than the match we just watched. And then the winner of that will be able to play against Bryant to try to stay alive in the winner's bracket. Yeah, both very difficult, very different than what we just watched, and uh, very different than what the two of us are used to playing in Legacy. Uh, we're going to be seeing a prison deck versus a combo deck at its essence, uh, a little bit more nuance than that, but it's definitely going to be interesting, especially uh, I'm excited to see a Caleb's deck play out a little bit more since it's the unique of the uh, the decks in the in this uh, group stage. Yeah, I, I've definitely watched some Caleb streams with him uh, brewing up and working with this. Uh mono blue deck and it's always entertaining to watch so i'm glad that i'm gonna be able to commentate it here